Isaiah chapter 60, if you will turn there, as we come to the end of this series of messages on questions about heaven, we, we've talked about, uh, we started off talking about, are you longing for heaven? And uh, sometimes we get caught up in this busy world and we uh, kind of lose sight of what our, what our home is going to be, where it's going to be, what's going to be happening there. You know, we're trying to get day by day, and so it's uh, hard to think about longing for something when you've got to go through so much before we get there. And we talked about what heaven's going to be like. We talked about what we're going to be like in heaven. And we, we, um, we picked out some scenes from heaven last week that Jesus taught about and uh, to give us some idea of what Jesus was saying. And then uh, today... We wrap it up talking about the culmination of what happens when the saints go marching in, when all the nations gather. You know, and from your comments that some of you have made uh, to me um, over the past several weeks, I, I think there are a lot of people that are fascinated by the topic of heaven. Uh, we haven't you know, I don't know, this is the first time I've done that, this length of a series about heaven. I've done sermons about it, but uh, nothing to the extent that we've done over the past uh, month or so. And as we've been looking at the uh, questions about heaven, we've learned that it's not just found in the book of Revelation, some things about heaven, but it's scattered throughout the Bible. And you'll discover that again today. Is scattered throughout the Bible, all kinds of imagery that, that brings us hope about the kind of life that we're going to have in heaven. We have discovered over the past several weeks that heaven is pictured for us in Scripture from a, like a garden to a city to the Father's house to a place where life and joy uh, resides. And the Bible is filled with all kinds of imagery that paints hope for us, that, that shows us sort of bright scenes of what our future days are going to be like. And central to the biblical vision, to the Bible vision of heaven, that we see that the future heaven is an unspoiled place unspoiled Jerusalem, a place, and this will shock people all across the United States of America when I say this today, but it will be a place of political harmony. Now, what, what we have present day is sort of utopian dreams, visions of utopia. You know, people have had visions of utopia for a long time. History tells us for a long, long time. There's, um, here's what happens when we try to make heaven here, utopia here. Uh, you, you go back into the, the late 70s and, and the Jim Jones thing in Guyana. You could go back in the late uh, to the early 90s. And then there's David Koresh and Waco. Those are the ones that got a lot of attention. But there's always been scattered places, little pockets of people throughout the world tried to create their own heaven here on earth. And it ended up disastrous for them. Matter of fact, you can go, you can go back as far as the book of Genesis and what did the people try to do there? They, they tried to build their, their tower of, uh, of Babel. They were going to build it so they can just get on up to heaven. They were going to make it the most perfect place to live. And there have been many failed attempts at a perfect city. But I think we have discovered over the past several weeks 
There, was, there is one yet to come that will not fail. Amen. All of us long for a place of perfect harmony and community. And I want to draw our attention about sort of the, the refreshing picture of a political world in heaven. And I've been thinking about uh, that old song since I started this series. It's an old song that, that originated from a black spiritual in the 1800s. Oh, when the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. If you look at the rest of the words in that song, it's filled with all kind of imagery. From the book of Revelation, such as uh, like when the moon turns red to blood and when the stars fall from the sky. And over the past several weeks, as we've looked at heaven, I hope that you have also thought within your own heart and your own life, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. The prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60, gives us a glimpse of the future and the utopia founded in Zion or, or in Jerusalem. And it's a, it's a world, you know, that, that is Look, that will be what God has promised. Today we live in a world where we expect the worst, don't we? We expect the worst, especially when it comes to the political stuff. So let's see today how things are going to function in heaven. The first thing we're going to see is the nations go marching on. Go marching on Isaiah 60. The, Isaiah 60 is really a poem, but it's also a vision of a very magnificent place. And the city that Isaiah envisions is, is a magnetic place. It's a, it has drawing power. That's where people want to be. People and things are flocking to this urban center. They, they're being turned into this city, gathered from many places. And you'll notice that they are people that are coming from afar. Now that's how some, no, I won't go there. Some people say afar for a different thing. We don't need to call the fire department today. <laughs> but... Isaiah 60 is a surprising picture of the future new heavens and the new earth. Look at, we're going to kind of bounce around throughout Scripture this morning, so bear with us. Isaiah 60, let's begin in verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous, they shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I might be glorified, and the least one shall become a clan, the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. Isaiah is borrowing some, we see language in Isaiah borrowed somewhat even years before from the picture that we see in Revelation. In the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, we're told at the end of all time, the city of God will, will come out of heaven and descend to the new earth itself. The city of God is going to be a radiant place 
where the glory of God, look at this, makes the sun obsolete. The sun in the sky, you know what it would be like with, with God's shining glory up there? The sun in the sky would be like us in Arizona in the Sonoran Desert holding a candle at 2 o'clock in the afternoon outside. It would not make much difference at all with the brightness of the sun in our sky. And the sun is not needed, it's not, it's not noticed because of the very glory of God and the light of God himself. God's light and God's glory will replace the sun. Next we can tell this is heaven, what Isaiah is talking about, because both John and Isaiah agree about the gates and the protection of this city. Verse 11, your gates shall be open continually day and night. They shall not be shut that people may bring to you the wealth of the nation with their kings led in procession. John says over in Revelation chapter 22, verse 25, that its gates will never be shut by day. Even when the city gates are wide open 24 hours a day, you know what? Nothing bad's going to happen. Nothing wicked is going to take place. Nothing atrocious is going to just happen to wander through those city gates. There's no violence, verse 18 tells us. When we sit down at, at night to watch the news or we look at our favorite news app in heaven, there's going to be no reports of gunshots fired, murders in the city, rapes, home invasions. There's no violence. Verse 18, violence shall be no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The transforming of God's salvation will impact every, listen to this, every aspect of human existence. It will impact every aspect of human existence. And while much of this picture in heaven is sort of what we would expect, Isaiah surprises us by telling us nations are present in heaven. Now, Isaiah 60 is, the, is the, the commentary say, is a, is a poem of 10 stanzas. And there are five stanzas in front of verse 12. There are five stanzas behind verse 12. So everything leads up to the decisive statement found in verse 12. For the nations and the kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. So that poses a question to us. What nations are going to heaven? Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 and 24. We've already talked about the city has no need of sun, moon, or shine on it. For the glory of God gives us light. Its lamp is a lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The Bible teaches us that God will remake both the heavens and the earth one day, so that everything will be remade. Everything will be remade including the nations. Every part of the government in the future new earth will function properly with perfect harmony and we will not worry about hanging chads. <laughs> we will not worry about voting machines that will not work. Everything will be in harmony. Verse 21a in Isaiah 60 
Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. There will be no injustice because everyone will be made new, morally good, by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. So as we look at this, we need to understand that the nations will continue marching on, but in a new way, a new format, a new righteousness, a new harmony that we can't even picture here on earth. The nations go marching on. But also in Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 9, we see that the nations will also go marching in. Isaiah 60, beginning in verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory shall be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, then bring good news and praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebel shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance upon my altar, and I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastland shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. I want to be in that number when that happens. They come from everywhere. The Lord has a magnetic quality about him. Your, your son shall come from afar. Your daughter shall be carried on the hip. Watch the saints go marching in. Watch them all march home. No distance is too great for anyone. The Bible says they come from afar. No weakness is too much to keep them from coming. The Bible says they shall be carried on the hill. There's no barrier to keep them from coming, for God's people belong to God's city. Even the oceans, the width, the depth, and the distance cannot prevent from coming. The ships of Tarshish first to bring children from afar. Now in verse 6, we read some names. That don't mean a lot to us today. But to give you sort of a picture, Midian and, and Sheba are the lands of the south. Ephah is probably what is called today uh, Yemen. Kedar and Nebeth are the north and the east. Tarshish was basically Spain. It was a, at that point in time in history, uttermost, farthest west thing anyone knew about. And here's something that's interesting. You think about all these nations. What, what's happening among those nations today? They fight. They don't get along with each other. The picture that Isaiah has given us is former enemies are now fellow worshipers. Why? Because they are now God's people. They are people bringing the good news and the praises of the Lord. They will come from the four corners of the earth. Now today, today, and we're going to talk about this probably more more in the next couple of weeks, God commands that we go to them with the message of Christ's love on our lips and in our hearts. Today we're to go to all the four corners of the earth so that one day the people 
shall come to him. But there's a day coming when you and I are going to be astonished at the numbers of people coming into the city. Verse 12 tells us how the nations are transformed. For the nation and the kingdom that will, that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid to waste. Now, over in the book, of, I'll read that because I want to point you to Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. Because Daniel also has a prophecy concerning this as well too. Daniel 7, 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Isaiah is given in the picture that one day godly people will rule the earthly kingdoms that were once ruled by ungodly people. Verse 10, Isaiah 60. Foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings, listen to this, and their kings shall minister to you, for in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. If we look at this closer, this is sort of like a public event that Isaiah is picturing for us here, where the political rulers who abuse their power in this life are given a public trial. Think about all the unrighteous rulers over history. Well, we can think of within our lifetime or within our history areas of study. Think about Hitler. Think about Stalin, Saddam Hussein, corrupt rulers in the modern world will one day stand before the people answering for their sinful, abusive, terrible ways. And we who are in Jesus Christ will walk on the new earth and we will reign and we will rule in righteousness. We've seen in verse 11 how the people are going to bring the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. A flourishing city is heaven. Commerce is happening there. Architecture is happening there. B.J. and I were talking earlier this morning, and we were talking about, about what happened. Well, I got walking on the streets of gold, so we're going to be uptown. We're going to be a big city. All kinds of stuff happening there. As the nations bring their goods into the new heaven and new earth. And you ask me, explain that a little bit Father John, and I will give you that simple, very simple theological truth that we have to live by today. We will understand it better by and by, because we're not there yet. But we have the promise of hope Amen. as we trust in God. And so we, may, we come down to this, and maybe the question that comes to our minds is, so what? Why does God tell us this? Because God wants us to be both, both holy and happy. Violence shall, be no more be, shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. There's so much unhappiness and worry in us today. And God tells us this stuff that we looked at over the past several weeks because He knows that we need 
the happiness of the next world to invade our lives even today. We all deal with personal problems of health. There's disappointments that we encounter in our lives. There's pain. There's hurt. There's discontentment. And the tragedy of pent-up pain of abuse really fills our news almost every day. Anger. And becoming, people becoming so angry they begin to take it out on themselves or upon others. Like the incident several weeks ago, the man at the Mall of the American Minneapolis that held the little boy and just dropped him from the balcony to the cement floor beneath. No one in their right mind does stuff like that. But there's so much of that that fills our lands today. But today, be happy because the best days are yet ahead of us. That's the message that God wants us to know about heaven. Picture the warm, personal embrace from Jesus as the angels take us into His presence one day. Picture a place where we no longer calendar memorial services or funeral services. Picture a day when J.P. is out of a job as a hospice chaplain. Picture a day when there's no more anxiety and fear. There's a picture over in Zechariah chapter 8 that that gives us, I think, a, a precious picture here. And he says, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. We're told to sing and be happy because God's going to be in our midst. This is the hope that we have today. We can share with our friends and with our family. If you're looking for an opening to be able to have a spiritual conversation, I'm going to give you one sentence that will open some doors that will help move into a spiritual conversation. You just simply have to say this. You know, Steve... This life is not all there is. And see what happens from there. This life is not all there is. Life on earth, you know what? It's just a dress rehearsal before the real production. Now, we hadn't thought about this, I don't think. Maybe you have. But we're going to spend far more time on the other side of death and eternity than we ever will here. Earth is the practice workout before the actual game. This life is preparation for the next life. And the question you may be having in your heart, in your life even today, is how, how do I get there? Well, I'm going to give you one way that will not work first, okay? There was a New York Times article in 20, in, sometimes in 2014, and Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, announced a $50 million gift to, to curb gun violence. And at the end of the article about all the charity of Bloomberg's work of him giving to so many different causes. The writer said this, or quoted him, pointing to his work on gun gun safety, obesity, and smoking cessation, he said with a grin, 
I am telling you if there is a God when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I have earned my place in heaven and it's not even close. My friend, if you are trying to earn your way to heaven, it's not even close. You will never make it through the gates. Instead, the only way to experience the life that has been promised to us through Scripture is to place your trust in Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Turn away from your sins. And here's the promise that we have found throughout this sermon series. You will know a joy after your death like you've never experienced before. It's as simple as that. Placing your trust in Jesus Christ. You're here today. Where are you placing your trust? Is that how much money you give? How many, how many times you go to church in your life? How kind you are to your family and your neighbors? That's all good, but so misguided. We earn eternal life. We grant, we're granted eternal life. We don't earn it. We're granted eternal life by grace of Jesus on the cross. And then we get to experience the wonders, the beauty, the glory the happiness, the joy, and all the things that God describes in His Word about our future home. How many of you this morning are marching to Zion? You're headed that way. When you have that assurance, you have that hope. If you're not, Today, will you begin that march to Zion by simply placing your faith and trust in Christ? Then I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. I want you, as we stand to sing this next song, I just want you to come down and tell me about it. Tell me that you have gotten off the path that you've been walking on, you're now on the pathway to heaven but because you have today simply trusted Jesus Christ. All you have to do is say, God, thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. I believe that. I trust that. Forgive me my sins. I want to start a new walk with you right now, today, forever. That's what we do. That's how we have the hope of eternal life. It's not so hard, is it? It's hard to do when we have to swallow our pride, we have to humble ourselves. But I tell you what, the benefits and the result of doing those two things, swallowing pride and humbling yourself, you will not regret it. You will rejoice over that commitment and that decision for eternity. Remember, hell is our default, but heaven is our choice. I'm going to pray, then we're going to stand, and we're going to sing. And we invite you to come and share with us today what God has done in your life. And you know what? There's not going to be one person in that room is going to boo 
or laugh at you. They're going to rejoice and celebrate as the very angels in heaven will do. Father, we've learned a lot. There's much more, so much more that we don't know, but we trust you to carry forth, carry forth what you have promised us. And therein lies our hope and our future forever. Give us courage to take the stand that we must today for Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.